I know you're wanting to listen to this episode of the Comics Alternative, but before we get started, let me just remind you guys that it's the gift-giving season. Now, that may be obvious, but one of the things that's not so obvious is that you can get all of your stuff and help out the podcast by going to comicsalternative.com slash Amazon. Click through on our Amazon banner that you find on that page, and whatever you get during that visit to Amazon, the Comics Alternative will get a few cents kickback. So, whether it be Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, or Festivus, get your gifts through our Amazon Associate link. It's a smart way to get your books, and you'll be helping out the podcast. And isn't that what the holiday season is all about? Helping our podcast. This is the Comics Alternative Eurocomics. Reviews of Pietro and The First Man. Bonjour, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Eurocomics. I'm Derek. And I'm Pascal. And we are two guys with advanced degrees talking about comics and translations. That's right. And on this episode of the Eurocomic series, Pascal and I are going to discuss two recent works in translation, both originally published in French. We're going to begin with Edmond Baudouin's Piero which comes out through New York Review Comics. And then after that, we're going to look at Jacques Ferrandez's adaptation of Albert Camus' The First Man, and that's published by Pegasus Books. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Euro Comics is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all Marvel, DC, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But occasionally, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. Yes, and if you look this month under New York Review Comics, you will find a solicitation for Letters to Survivors, a graphic novel by a famed French uh, artist called Gébé, uh, who is one of the founders of Charlie Hebdo. Um, he's a very controversial figure in France, but a very interesting, interesting uh, artist. So this is a, um, a translation from a 1981 graphic novel he did which is contemporary of Dying Laughing, if you remember our Mm -hmm. review of that book. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, and they're actually in the same genre. And then uh, as far as Pegasus is concerned, this month we have a solicitation for Bebop Barbarians, a hardcover graphic novel by Gary Phillips and Dale Berry. And uh, this is a a book focusing on uh, the U.S. uh, in the... In the 50s and the civil rights movements, it looks very interesting. So two uh, very interesting books coming out from Pegasus and New York Review Comics on DCBS. That's right. And great discounts. Exactly. <laughs> you have so many great discounts at Discount Comic Book Service, and not just comics in translation, but English language ones, of course, as well. So go to dcbservice.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your texts there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Pascal and Derek sent you. Exactly. Pascal, officially, this is our November Eurocomics mm-hmm. episode. Late November. <laughs> it's Yeah, very late November. It's late November into early December, and I know that both of us had a lot going on. And in fact, you had kind of a, I guess it was a somewhat surprise or quick trip down to Colombia in South America. That is correct. So I, I was there uh, <clears throat> meeting and working with uh, other colleagues teacher english teachers giving them trainings so uh yeah it was it took some time but it was fun and now i'm back 
and actually checked out the comics uh, scene over there, and they have quite a bit going on, so it was exciting. That's cool. Now, I, I know that at, at one point I thought that we were going to get the November show in, in November, but you were out of town, and mm-hmm. so we just thought we'd wait till you got back, and so this is November. But we will be back, and we hope on time in December, with a December Eurocomic show. So you can look at it this way. You get two shows from us for the Eurocomic series in the month of December. The November one and the official December. Exactly. Let's begin with the first text that we're going to look at, and this is Piero by Edmond Baudouin, and this one came out from New York Review Comics in very early November, and it is translated and with an introduction by comics creator Matt Madden, who does some really good books. Uh, I don't know if yes. you, are, are, you're familiar with Matt's work, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so it's interesting that he's the translator of this, and I think he writes a really good introduction. Now, I have Mm -hmm. to say, I've never read any of Baudouin's books before, and I think that the only English language translation of his stuff uh, is actually that Salvador Dali book for the Art Master series of Self Made Heroes. Is that correct? And that came out, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago. Yes, and that was not really a representative of his work, I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this is a major uh, author out of France that has been active for <clears throat> a while. First book published in 81. Um, and actually the book we're discussing today is 20 years old. It's, it was published in 1988. Um, and I'm very happy to see his major work you know, appearing in English. Because there was definitely a gap in uh, for, you know, for his books not being published in the U.S. at all, or very little, um, because of the importance that he, you know, he has in the especially in the alternative indie scene in France, uh, because he was really a trailblazer and uh, inspired uh, l'association and all the guys that reshaped. Um, the comic book landscape, you know, Sfar, Louis Trondheim, and all those guys, mm-hmm. really, you know, really influenced by him. You know, this reminds me, It's this is not unlike what we experienced or what we were talking about on the last Euro comic show, you know, where we looked at Satouf's first three yes. volumes in English <laughs> of The Arab of the Future, and you were making the point that this is a major French comics artist – but it's not – and he's, he's published quite a number of things in addition yes. to The Arab of the Future, but only now or relatively recently in the past couple of years or so are we getting him in translation, and it's a long mm-hmm. time in coming. So you're saying that it's the same uh, situation with Baudin. Uh, yeah, Baudin is actually Baudouin. – it's even uh, more uh, impressive because he's – He's published now. I was looking through his his uh, bibliography. We're talking about seventy graphic novels. Wow! I mean, Jeez. it's a lot of material that remains to be translated. Um, compare Satouf compared to him is a beginner. <laughs> well, well, why do you think it's taken so long to get his work in English? I mean, that I'm not counting the the Dali for a book from Self Made yes. Hero, but you know, this being his first work, and you say he had what seventy seventy some books. In mm-hmm. French, why is it taking so long? You think for him to be translated? I think because he was such, um, like I said, a trailblazer. In, even in France, they didn't really know where to put him because, you know, in the eighties, he was publishing in a format similar to this, in in black and white, and it didn't fit the. It's only until Association got got that format more popular that his books got, you know released widely and he got more acclaim. Mm-hmm. And I think in the U.S., some of the – maybe his mm, uh, visual style is is very unusual and maybe it's it needs a lot of, uh, I think, contextualization to get the thing out. And I think this is a good place to start. Peel is a good place to start and the introduction helps a lot kind of understand 
what this book, where this book belongs in his in his works. And the other aspect of it, and I, that's one thing that Matt Madden, Matt Madden does very well, is there is a poetry to his writing that maybe is a little challenging to translate. Um, it's not, yeah, the, the way he writes is is quite unusual for for uh, I think graphic novel writing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's a challenge to really capture that. Another thing, yeah. Sh- yeah, go ahead. Well, I say another thing that Madden points out in his introduction is that. Uh, Baudin is kind of situated between two generations because on the one hand, he has been associated with older writers, for instance, like Tardy, that Mm -hmm. are his contemporaries. At the same time, he eventually became associated, as you've mentioned, with L'Association and, Mm -hmm. you know, a younger, more experimental generation Mm -hmm. of writers. So... Whereas I would think on the one hand that benefits him, on the other hand, it kind of puts him in kind of an in-between place, which may not necessarily work to his benefit, depending, you know, because people don't know how to to peg him, so to speak. And whether we want to or not, we probably unconsciously try to group creators into certain yes. schools or certain generations. Again, whether mm-hmm. that's useful or that's another matter, it's up for debate. Uh, but if he is kind of this in between figure in terms of generational styles and um, sensibilities, then people may not know what to do with him. Let's say, as opposed to Marjane Satrapi, right? Or correct, Johan Spar, and, or, or or Jacques Tardy, for that matter. Yes, and I think what, one other major thing that is uh, that. I think a reader needs to know is that when he published his first book in 81, he was uh, an accountant and I forgot, he, he was not a young man. He started publishing in his 30s. And I think that also creates kind of a divide with um, even the, the artists of this generation, um, you know, people like Tardy and, and uh, of, like Lustal, people like this who were, who started as young men and, you know, just launch their careers and so and same thing for satrapi there's like a youthfulness about what she did early on you know she was uh, much younger than he was when he started so he came up with all when he came on the scene he was this older guy and everybody was this is odd why you know this is very unusual i think for um somebody to kind of have a second a second life basically and now he's in his uh, 70s and he's still publishing books, um, so it's quite quite an unusual career. And I, like you say, he's kind of a most like a, a, a lone ranger <laughs> uh, in between generations. But when he was adopted by the association, was more like as a as a father figure, you know, because he was probably twenty twenty five years older than anybody at l'association at the time. So that makes him special. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we we've talked about uh, the creator. Let's let's talk about the text, uh, yes. Piero it, itself. Mm-hmm. Now, this is. Would you call this a memoir? Uh, I, I yes, I would. It it I, I, that makes sense to me, and, and the reason I asked about that, and I'm a little hesitant to just come right out and say, yeah, this is a memoir. It it's a different kind of recollection, uh, and in yes. many ways, mm-hmm. I think it has quite a bit in common with the first man. And Mm -hmm. we can discuss that when we get to the first man in the second half of the show. Uh, Both of the books remind me of Marcel Proust. Yes. In that – now, Remembrances of Things Past. Mm -hmm. What's the the French title? Uh, Le Temps? Oh, À la recherche du temps perdu. Yeah, okay. That's it. We're going to have a big discussion about this title. Should we do it now? (laughs) Because it's one of the things I want to bring up for the next book. But – um, okay, do you think it's more appropriate to bring it up with Piero or with First Man? I think they both apply, but it's it's directly uh, – in the First Man, the book is mentioned directly. Right. Right. <clears throat> but it's it's a translation uh, issue that I had because I just realized you the English uh, translation – the English titles changed in the 90s, which is very odd to me, but – 
So apparently the book is now In Search of Lost Time. I, no yeah, longer, I think so, yeah. And No Longer a Remembrance of Things Past, which was, I thought that was the title. Yeah, which is what uh, it was called in translation for, for the longest time. Yes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the focus on, uh, yeah, the small memories from the childhood, from from childhood, right, that inform um, the life of, of the uh, the author today. Um, so something very um, sometimes tactile or or very small in his relationship with his brother, Pierrot, um, definitely has kind of a Proustian feel mm-hmm. and a it, non-linear, kind of non-linear, non almost non-narrative sometimes. Exactly. Um, and that's why I spec- somewhat hesitated <laughs> coming right out and saying that this is a graphic memoir, because mm-hmm. even though it is in many ways, at the same time, the way that it's structured, and as you put it, the kind of non-linear way mm-hmm. that it brings up the past, especially as it may inform what's going on with the current uh, Mamon, you know, Edmund mm-hmm. figure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we find the exact same thing in The First Man as well, which we'll discuss when we get to in a little while. But uh, mm-hmm. it is a different kind of work or memoir, again, if we want to call it that. So, you know, when we have something like uh, Epileptic or uh, Persepolis, mm-hmm. I think those are more outright memoirs, autobiographical kind of works in that there is a story where one event or one scene or one remembrance, if you want to look at it that way, kind of links directly with what comes next and then with what comes next, so on and so forth. Here, it's a little different. Now, I mean, I'm not suggesting that in Piero there's no interconnectedness among the various memories that Edmond or Maman come, comes to, or brings to the fore throughout the narrative. Mm-hmm. But... It is much more free-flowing, and you can find one scene that may have – or one remembrance that has – with his brother, uh, Piero, whose real mm-hmm. name is Pierre, that has nothing to do with what preceded it or with anything that comes after. They're just these mm-hmm. moments of reflection or recollection of his time with his brother, especially as it related to drawing because art, drawing – and drawing together especially is a major part of Piero. Definitely. And I would add, um, there is, I think this is, if we say it's a memoir, it's almost a memoir about memory and, uh, and the way memory is organized. And, um, I, and it's to me, there's a, it's maybe more s- similar in a way to works of the th- uh, work on the memory that like Chris Ware or or Seth were are doing. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. I, I I feel that connection there, even though their art style is extremely different. But the approach, I think, it's it's closer to that than a straight up uh, graphic memoir like you know Satrapi. That's or even Satouf actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, I want to come back to something that I brought up just a moment ago, and that is mm-hmm. the emphasis on art, because I think yes. that's, you know, that is a major part of this book. And mm-hmm. I think that these moments that Maman or Edmond is mm-hmm. remembering with his brother Piero, mm-hmm. and, and we should mention, and we find this out in the last part of the book, that as they get older and go off to school, that that uh, their family sends Piero off to art school, mm-hmm. whereas Ed- Edmond yeah. or Maman doesn't. In fact, he becomes what an accountant like his father. He goes to, to school to to learn accountancy. Mm-hmm. Um, but we know he eventually became an artist because we're holding the book in our hand. Uh, but uh, so and Pier- Piero did not. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. In fact, he it, it, toward the end of the book, he just says. That he's frustrated, he just wants to to quit, give up art. Yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. He says art school is only about talk and money. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, yeah, and I think it's a the the book is clearly positioned those those two kids in a family that it's not a poor family, but it's maybe you know lower middle class. They may they don't have access to a lot of things, so they're 
number one occupation is the cheapest kind of thing you can do is draw, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that really drives their lives um, through school. But yeah, the reason only one of them goes to art school is is basically they cannot afford sending both. And I, and I think the fact that the brother who goes to art school rejects it, um, this is really Edmond Baudouin making a point about you know, um, the trajectory or your, your, your life story, how do you become an artist has really nothing to do with what school you attend. Mm -hmm. It's a personal journey and he's one example of that, definitely. And we do get quite a bit of speculation on art, or if not speculation, then just a series of questioning about mm -hmm. what you know. What is art? Or uh, I guess Maman is the narrator. Of course, this is his um, his own story, his remembrances is telling us that he was trying to make sense of some of the pictures and illustrations that mm -hmm. he was looking at when he was younger. And then there's one passage. In the book, and this is on page 84 that really stood out to me. And this is not the first time that he mentions, let's say, the dots of a photograph, because at one yes. point he recalls looking at a photograph in a newspaper. And mm -hmm. if you pull back far enough from it, it looks cohesive, right? But if yes. you lean in and look very closely at the image, especially if you take a magnifying glass, he says, and mm -hmm. you look at the photograph or the image in the newspaper, then it becomes much less realistic and cohesive and more like a series of dots, mm -hmm. you know, of, of various densities. But anyway, on page 84, uh, he's this comes right after a recollection of him being in school and the kids wanting him to do illustrations for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so on 84, he says, as with the dots in photographs, always the same questions. At what points do line at what point do lines, marks, scratches stop being grass, rocks, a tree, branches? And why, if you try too hard, do you end up killing the sense of life? And, and there's something quite deep about that passage. I mean, I think that yes. there's something deep throughout the entire book, but I th mm -hmm. that page in particular really stood out to me because he's trying he and his brother to a large degree individually and together are trying to use their art their illustrations their drawings to make sense of what's around them to make sense of their own relationship uh to to grow closer together and that's uh uh, Baudin's or Maman, the, the narrator's way of trying to understand the world around him. And so when he asks, you know, at what point do, you know, lines, marks and scratches stop being grass, rocks and trees and branches, you know, again, it all depends on how you look at it, right? Because if you look too close, if you look too hard, as he says, then what had seemed to be grass, rocks, trees and branches are no more or nothing more than points, dots, lines, scratches. And so I guess it has to deal with perspective as well. Yeah, and it's quite amazing that without any kind of art training, he was thinking um, about <clears throat> what it means to draw a line on a piece of paper and say it represents something or not uh, at a young age. There's another part that I felt very powerful, was very powerful, is when he um, says that his, his brother um, likes to draw the lines and contours of things, whereas he's focusing now on um, the, the mass of blacks or um, those, those scratches, more abstract things that when you bring them together, it forms a picture, mm -hmm. just like the offset printing. And he's changing his way of looking at things and his way of his approach when he's drawing, basically. Because um, drawing the the line, the line work, which is kind of the base of uh, uh, comic book art, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and he goes beyond that, and he's looking at 
textures and um, there's a, a page where we see uh, a street with cars that's rendered that way where it's blotches uh, that form a car instead of lines so he's already thinking um, in ways and looking at the world in, in a different way through through his art mm. which is a very kind of interesting um, process I thought for for especially a, you know a very young um, very young well, it's a young boy young adult I guess and the two perspectives of the brothers like I there's one question I wanted to ask you about the book the book is called Pierrot right mm-hmm do you feel that the book is about Pierrot or about Edmond? Oh, I think it's definitely about Edmond. Um, All right. But it's it's Edmond within the context of his brother Pietro. So, I mean, without Pietro, I think we wouldn't get the kind of view of Edmond or Maman as as we have. In other words, he appears clearer in contrast or in association with his brother than he would just by himself, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. There, there was something interesting when I uh, I was reading the book. I don't know if you had the same experience. But especially in the early part of the book, we have those two kids who are very close in age. And the way they're represented is not – it's not very clearly – they are not very clearly differentiated, and they have the same kind of activities. They, they have this very symbiotic relationship. Yeah, they do who's everything who together. in the illustrations? Yes, and yeah. I never knew we, who was who. I never knew who was Edmond, who was Pierrot at the beginning. And at the beginning, I was trying to figure it out. So is this, who, is this Pierrot? Is this Edmond? And then after a while, I, I thought it doesn't really matter. I, you know, it's I, – I, I just – let myself, you know, um, be taken by those little moments, and and then slowly in the story, they they kind of I, I felt they take on a different path, not only because of the school, but uh, because of the different ways they draw, and uh, they may not have exactly the same interests. Uh, there's also the health issue that Pierrot ha- has that kind of keeps him from doing physical activities, uh, whereas Edmond. Uh, can run around more easily. Um, they're also, their their interest in girls is, I, I think, is a little different. It seems that Pierrot was more into girls than Edmond at some point. Yeah, an interesting choice to to m- make it a little, almost like it's the same person at the beginning, and then it becomes two. I don't know if you had this experience as well. No, I did, and in fact, I my uh, experience reading Pierrot is similar to yours in that at first I was trying to figure out, okay, in terms of these illustrations, which Mm -hmm. one is the narrator, Edmond, and which one is his younger brother, Pierrot, and -hmm. I couldn't figure it out. And I was going back to look through certain clues. So, for instance, you know, does one have a mole that the other one doesn't? No. Does one have a different hairstyle that that the other one doesn't? Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, Is there an occasion, let's say especially in the first two-thirds of the book, where one of the illustrated figures addresses the other, and not just in, so to speak, voiceover, you know, remembrance, but when one says, you know, hey, Piero, let's do such mm-hmm. and such. And so I could get a grasp on who, at least momentarily, Piero was, and I really couldn't find that. But no. like you, mm-hmm. I kind of gave up after a while because I thought, you know, one of the major points – at least in the first two-thirds of the book, or the first half especially, is the fact that these two brothers are inseparable and that their life together basically is what's defining the narrative. And Mm -hmm. and that really really struck me, and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't have a clear distinction, uh, visual distinction, between the two brothers because they are inseparable. And this is interesting. Another passage that really stood out to me, I think, kind of underscores this. And this is on page 39. And for, I guess, up until this point, one of the things that uh, Baudin has uh, done is he's emphasized the two of them together over and over again. Uh, They go outside, they wander in the woods together. They sit Mm -hmm. down and they draw together. He even mentions a few pages before 39 about how, you know, as you mentioned, they're lower middle class, they don't have much money, they share a bed. 
So they mm-hmm. share a bed together. And not only that, it seems the way that Edmond uh, describes it, they even dream together. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because we have, I think, the first of what is, I think, two scenes, if I'm not mistaken, on page 35, 36, and 37, where the two of them are flying because they're in bed Mm -hmm. together. And it's almost like they're dreaming together and they're flying over the earth. They're holding hands and making observations and having a good time. But then on page 39, uh, Edmond recalls one of the things that they used to do is to go to a place in the village and play with the local clay that they called red dirt. And this was clay that really didn't have any rocks in it. So it was like, you know, pure clay that they could make figures out of. And uh, Edmond says on page 39, we would use the red dirt to make tanks, guns, cows, sheep, and little men. Then we would destroy them. But then it's this last panel at the bottom of the page that really Mm -hmm. got me. He says, inevitably, we would finish up by making a sheet, a blanket, two pillows, (laughs) uh, a a, a a bolster, a bed, and two children. We didn't destroy this last creation. We would leave it behind to dry up in some nook. And we drew every day. And it's the two of them in bed together that we had just seen a few pages previously. So again, Mm -hmm. that really underscores the... Uh, the the fact that these two, you know, are inseparable. Yes, mm-hmm. and and they don't. Yeah, and the fact they don't destroy this figure, it becomes almost like, a, yeah, it's almost a a little figurine that is part of a ritual that they would have, mm-hmm. like they self represent and hide it somewhere. It's like their secret or something like that. But yeah, it's a powerful detail about their relationship and i was thinking about uh another moment in the book where um there is it almost like they become aware that they are they are two different uh, people i felt or that their identities are independent and that's page 93 where um they are older they're teenagers and um a girl asks uh, Edmond, you are Pierre's brothers, right? And he says, whose brother? <laughs> oh, yeah, Pierre. And then she says, can you ask him to draw, you know, for a drawing? And then the next panel we see, they're actually, uh, it's a long shot. They're very far away on the horizon, the two brothers talking. And then Edmond says, I today I found out your name is Pierre. And uh, Pierre says, what about you? Are you Momon or Edmond? <laughs> and he says, yeah, but Momon is lame and Pierrot is nice. Says, Stop it, Momon. isn't lame. Anyway, I could never call you anything else. But then there's this panel where they are together. And then there's a panel where you see only Pierrot, I believe. Cause he, and, and it says it was, it was the, age of the, the age of the mopeds. And there is a big thing about having a moped and riding moped around. But they only have one moped for two. Um, but I, I felt that at this moment, there's kind of a a first step in, you know, we're kind of taking slightly different path and we we kind of abandon our, not really a, completely abandoned, but there's a change in their, the way they are named and the way people relate to them as two different, two different uh, young men, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting uh it's an interesting pass- passage after the one you just described where they were like so close and then there is this moment where the names shift. So very interesting. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of the last part of this book, there's something – I don't want to say sad, but mm-hmm. rather muted or somber – the way mm-hmm. that this narrative or this recollection or series of recollections ends because, you know, as as we mentioned, Piero, who had gone on to art school and seemed to be in many ways kind of a uh, point of hope for mm-hmm. his older brother, Maman, uh, decides to quit art school. And and then uh, Edmond or Maman says, if Piero was quitting, and this is, begins on page 121, who was mm-hmm. going to keep dreaming? Maybe Piero meant it to happen this way. Maybe he wanted to pass something along to me, like a relay. My brother's ears are a little pointy, like a Martian's, and there's a scene from 
their their Martian fantasy that we see at the beginning of the book. When mm-hmm. I ask him now, he tells me that no, he's not a Martian, just an interior designer. That's his job. As for me, I quit being an accountant so I could draw, so I could dream, so I could keep mm-hmm. being a child, maybe just so I could make this book, which becomes, mm-hmm. you know, self referential at the end. So whether I guess on the one hand, as I'd mentioned, there's something kind of somber in that Piero gives up art. Yes. On the other hand, there's something kind of hopeful because as Edmond describes it, it's like the baton has been passed from Piero Correct. to Edmond. Yeah, and I yeah, there is some yeah, it's it's maybe bittersweet in a way. But I think like you said, there is hope because even though Edmond became an accountant, at some point in his life, he, like you say, took the baton from his brother and actually embraced uh, the artistic life and became a prominent artist. There is one thing in this passage you just talked about that I wanted to go back to is the Martian scene, mm-hmm. the, the Martian, right? Initially in their game, so they pretend a, a, a Martian is coming down to Earth and they, they go talk to him. And I love that little detail where they they are rushing because they they imagine seeing the the spacecraft um, crashing and they they rush towards it but they say let's first get our sketchbooks <laughs> which was kind of interesting so they can represent what they see in their mind but after the encounter with the Martian who is trying to to get uh, fuel for his spacecraft and the fuel turns to be turns out to be dreams and the kid who is there with the Martian. I f- and I forgot we, if it's Piero and Edmond, that's one of my problems. <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, gives him dreams so he can fly away in his spacecraft. But before he leaves, he shoots um, the child in the head with his special ray gun that wipes out memory. Mm-hmm. And we see that scene again in one page, on page 122. Um, and I was wondering about the meaning of this in terms of uh, if he's saying that the Martian is Pierrot, right? He's saying that he's got – my brother's ears are a little pointy like a Martian. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody between the two has lost something, lost the the will to be an artist, and the, you know, he's giving up. Um, but for a part of his life, Edmond forgot to be an artist as well, right? Right. Until something happened, and he, and we don't have that part of the story as an adult where he decided to actually become an artist. But I think it was interesting that he brought this, this he, he actually redrew that scene with the ray gun, like something was lost at this point, you know? Mm-hmm. It's kind of the, their game, their childhood game was actually a meaningful metaphor for what was happening. So I thought that was, was an interesting touch. I don't know how you looked at this part, but. Yeah, no, no. I, I I read the the Martian scene, the early Martian scene, uh, in similar ways to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, and I think that's part of uh, kind of the poetry and the subtlety of the work is uh, bringing meaning to child play in, in a very important kind of making childhood is the center of what makes a person, and it's very interesting that one of the quotes that is um, listed and I think it's in the introduction of the first man that's not a segue but kind of (laughs) (laughs) that uh, I think it's uh, if I can remember it says it's it's actually in the intro oh in uh, Madden's intro yes or the scholar there's a right it's a Camus scholar there's there are two no it's actually in the intro to the first man I'm sorry but I felt it was meaningful for the other book. It's like those books are talking to each other in a way. Uh, I mean, that, you know, that is interesting because I, I, I didn't plan it this way. I don't know if you had something in mind that I didn't know about, but no, <laughs> we had, we had, we've been wanting to discuss Piero for a while, and then mm-hmm. we got a copy of the graphic adaptation of Camus' The First Man, and thought, oh, well, let's let's discuss that. As well, uh, and I didn't know how they paired until I actually read both of them, and I thought, "Oh my God!" I mean, there's a lot of similarity between the two. Yes, and I found a quote. Okay, so it's the ch- the child is the father of the man. 
Oh, uh, Wordsworth. Yes. So it's mentioned in in uh, in the first man book, which applies very well to it. And I thought this also works for for um, for Pierrot, right? Mm-hmm. So that was my segue. <laughs> okay. Well, since you provided the segue and the connective tissue or some of the connective tissue between Pietro and the first man, let's go ahead and start talking about the first man. Sounds good. Yeah. So this is based on or an adaptation of the very, I guess we could call it the very last publication of Albert Camus. And as the, um, oh, I can't remember who does the introduction to this book. I mean, there's a translator's note, but then. Uh, the the person who writes the introduction, what's her name? Or Alice his? Kaplan? Yes. Uh, one of the things she mentions is a little history about this. Now, mm-hmm. when uh, Camus died, he was with he was with his publisher, Gallimard. Yes. And there was a car accident, lost control of the car, uh, smacked into a tree, and Camus was killed instantly. Not Gallimard. I think he died later in the hospital. But one of the things that Albert Camus had with him was a manuscript that he was working on that he was calling The First Man. So he wanted this to be his masterpiece. In fact, he envisioned it being something like Proust's Remembrances of Things Past uh, or or his War and Peace. War and Peace. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is, is another a ma- way. Massive work, yes. A massive work, yes. Uh, so something like a War and Peace, maybe even a like a Moby Dick, if you want to throw that in there. Uh, <laughs> you know, never, never shy away from referencing Melville. Uh, mm-hmm. Is my philosophy, but uh, <laughs> but it was incomplete. And so one of the things that I think his family had considered doing, and his publisher had considered doing is to come out with the unfinished manuscript not too long after his death, but there was something kind of gauche about that. Um, So it wasn't until, when was it, the 1980s, 90s? I can't remember. It's the 90s, I think, 1994. It's pretty late. The daughter Mm -hmm. uh, gathered everything, uh, had the manuscript cleaned up, because apparently Camus was – not the neatest of writers when it came to drafts. Uh, mm-hmm. So, she, but she was able to come up with as best as she could the incomplete or unfinished work of Camus, the First Man. And I remember when this came out. So, yeah, you're right; it is the nineties. I think I was in grad school at the time, uh, mm-hmm. and I intended to read it because I was a big fan of Camus. In fact, I was uh, when I was in a liberal studies program at UNC Greensboro. I didn't finish my thesis because i was in grad school in the in a master's program in english at purdue uh mm-hmm. primarily is the reason i didn't have the time and then ran out of time but i was going to do my thesis on the philosophical disagreements of camus and jean paul sartre and so mm. i you know I, I i was much more of a camus guy than i was a sartre man and so i i was immersed in camus and I even, with the help of someone, even translated some of his essays that hadn't been translated yet. But I had intended to read The First Man when it came out in the 90s, but I never got around to it. Now, have you read Camus' The First Man, the incomplete uh, masterpiece, nope. so to speak? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. no. I haven't either, and uh, I, I wish I had before I read this, but I don't think it's necessary. It's not like you need to have read the prose version of The First Man before you read this. Now this is uh this is translated by Ryan Bloom but the visual translation so to speak is by Jacques Ferrandez is that how you pronounce his name Ferrandez Fer- mm-hmm. Fer- so you do pronounce the z at the end Yes okay. uh, yeah this is kind of a southern okay. name so when we get to the south of France, uh, the pronunciation is closer to Spanish. Okay. It's actually probably a Spanish name, okay. Ferrandez or something. Ferrandez, <laughs> okay, Ferrandez. Yeah. And, and it's not Fernandez, it's Ferrandez, which Fernandez. Yeah, is a little confusing. A lot of people call him Fernandez by mistake because that's yeah. a more common last name. But yeah, uh, This and, came uh, out in early October from Pegasus Books. And mm-hmm. one of the things that's notable about this is that this is the second Ferrandez book 
adapting a Camus narrative that has come out mm-hmm. from Pegasus Books. Now, in 2016, uh, Fernandez published or came out with an adaptation of The Stranger. And in fact, mm-hmm. on the July 13th episode of the Comics Alternative, so a little over two years ago, Gene and I discussed this book, The Stranger, mm-hmm. which is really good. And I find it interesting that after The Stranger, the text that Fernandez chose to adapt is The First Man. Mm-hmm. I would have thought that it would be La Peste or The Plague. Um, yeah, or La Chute or something, yes. Or The Fall. Yeah, well, La Chute or The Fall. I mean, I would love to see an adaptation of that. But here's the problem with La Chute, is that La Chute or The Fall is narrated – in some ways, almost in the second person, but not quite. Yes. Mm-hmm. It, it's a first person narration, and the speaker is addressing an unknown, unacknowledged, or at least unnamed um, listener. Mm-hmm. And so, part of the, I, I, I guess, the project of La Chute. Is that oh god, and I can't remember who the narrator is, who, who what his name is, but he is in many ways kind of confessing to his listener, yes, some issues or things that had gone on in the past. The most significant of which is his hesitancy of helping someone that he almost knew was going to throw herself off, off the bridge and probably commit suicide mm-hmm. uh, at night as he's passing her and. He doesn't do anything about it, and he's haunted by that moment for the rest of his life. And so that's one of the things that he's guilty of, and that's considered in many ways his fall. That's the title. But he tries to talk to his listener, and they're at a bar, I believe it is, in Mm -hmm. such a way that he tries to get his listener implicated through the act of listening. It's a fascinating text. and. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons, the way that it's narrated to an unnamed uh, listener that in many ways becomes you, the reader, right? Uh, Because you (laughs) as a reader can almost become implicated in the narrator's, so to speak, crime, uh, the way that it's written. I don't know how successful that could be adapted into comics form. Maybe it can, but I think it would be much more of a challenge. So it makes more sense that Ferrandez would adapt the first man before La Chute. Uh, but, the, but, the, but the plague, I think, or La Peste, mm-hmm. is a much more straightforward – it's probably Camus' most straightforward narrative of mm-hmm. all that he'd written, uh, maybe with the exception of some of the short stories. Yeah, and I I don't know. I, we mentioned this before uh, when we were discussing um, – the David B. book, um, uh, Asib and the Queen of the Serpents. Mm-hmm. Uh, those two books, actually those three books, The Stranger, The First Man, and the uh, David B. book, are part of the same collection in France. In the, It's a Gallimard uh, collection. Uh, and the purpose of the collection is to adapt uh, literary works. So they, also, they actually have a Huck Finn uh, they have uh, Little Prince, a lot of uh, French uh, literature as well. Um, and the audience is probably younger readers, maybe not like very young, but maybe teenage to uh, to like uh, yeah, high school to early university, maybe. I, that, there's also a great Gatsby, actually. Hmm. Uh, so... I don't know to which extent, like, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how Ferrandez uh, approach, you know, those are, because if it's part of a collection, they probably have restrictions on what part of the catalog they <laughs> they can let you adapt. I don't know exactly what the decisions are there. But, um, yeah, it's almost alpha and omega of, of the Camus work in a way. And he's doing. Yeah, starting and, with the first, The Stranger, and then the very last, The First Man. Mm-hmm. And I think also the the connection to, I mean, La Peste is also extremely connected to Algeria, but this book is also very connected to Algeria, and, uh, and, and uh, Ferrandez being uh, also uh, personally connected to Algeria helps 
I think is portrayal, uh, like the the lights and and the the setting is is spot on. It it feels you know, it feels like the place. I I think, mm-hmm. um, and I was thinking it seems that we have. Uh, a weird theme in our Euro comics thing. I mean, it's not weird, but it's just coincidence, but it's like the third book about, um, French, the Franco Algerian, uh, you know, difficult, uh, history. Hmm. Uh, right. We've that. had yellow Negroes. I had, a uh, something about that. And then, uh, it's not, uh, America is beautiful. Right. Right. No, yeah. Algeria is, is beautiful. Like America. Mm hmm. Uh, and now this one, so it's it's kind of interesting. Actually, you were saying like the in fifty uh, when they they would have released this book, the first man, not long after Camus' death, but it was the early sixties was right during the the uh, apex of of the Algerian conflict, mm-hmm. and it would have been very difficult to publish that book at that time because Camus was ahead of his time in in the way of thinking about this conflict. I, I think the French people uh were not ready for what he the way he approaches uh, what it is to be French colonial uh, pied noir, you know, the black feet. Um I don't think they were ready for that at the time. It was too they were right in the middle of the conflict, so it would have been tough. Yeah. Well you know I hope we see more Camus translations or adaptations uh, from Ferrandez in the years, right, yes. yeah, in the years to come, and, and not just let's say the fall or uh, the plague. Uh, I think it'd be great if we had the stories that make up Exile in the Kingdom mm-hmm. collected in uh, in, or in in or adapted into graphic form. That'd be good, especially you know famous stories from Exile in the Kingdom, like The Guest. I think that's probably mm-hmm. the most famous. And most cited stories in that collection. Don't know if you could do a graphic adaptation of the myth of Sisyphus, though, <laughs> <laughs> or why you would want to, uh, or the rebel for that matter. But those, those are famous long essays. But uh, mm-hmm. well, you know, let, let's talk about the first man now. You know, as I said, it's based on Camus' Le Premier Homme, or the first <laughs> man. Uh, the translator of this work is Ryan Bloom, and he even has a short introduction where he explains mm-hmm. some of the, the decisions that he makes when translating this work, especially it being incomplete. And even though it's, I guess, officially a work of fiction, it's similar to Piero in a variety of ways, as, as we've pointed out. But it's similar to Piero in that its protagonist, the first man's protagonist, Jacques Comori, is that how you pronounce the ne- last name? Mm-hmm. Comerie. Yes. Yeah. Comerie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is in many ways kind of just a stand in for Camus himself. Yes. Because the mother being from Algeria, uh, mm-hmm. being close to the mother, uh, his uh, association with the Paris literary world, his love of the sun, the ocean. You know, there's something very poetic in Camus' writing about Algeria when mm-hmm. he's on the beach, when he's in the ocean, when he's in the sun. I mean, those are the most touching moments in, mm-hmm. I think, all of Camus' writing. And that comes through in Ferrandez's The First Man as well. Definitely. So, yeah, so Comori is a stand in for Camus himself, but this is a work of fiction, not a memoir, although. It does kind of approach memoirdom, I guess we could say. Yes, I, I believe so as well. And yeah, Komoi being a, also being a, a writer. And oh yeah, um, and uh, the, the book is divided into thirteen different chapters in, in a varying lengths, right? Mm-hmm. Because we have some chapters like, <clears throat> let's say, Thursdays and vacations that are either you know, medium size or longer. And then we have other chapters like the third Paris that are only just a few pages. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But it basically, oh, Jessica, yeah, or, or, or Jessica, yeah, and it takes us through Comrie's life more or less chronologically. Although there are flashbacks, you know, so in terms of what happens in the narrative outside of flashbacks, there's really not much jumping around. I mean, the very first chapter is called "Birth," and this is uh, Jacques Comrie's birth, as mm-hmm. you might guess. And then, when by the time we get to, let's say, the penultimate chapter, the attack. Sadek, this is when the Algerian conflict, uh, the war with um, with with uh, France, is you know I guess at its height, mm-hmm. uh, or at least about at its height. But then we get to the last chapter, which is very prosaic. In fact, there are sections of this graphic adaptation of the First Man that are very wordy. And yes. you and I were talking mm-hmm. off mic about how. You know, both of us were a little surprised at how dense this book was because you pick mm-hmm. it up and, okay, it's album sized, right? Yes. Um, really nice. And just flipping through it, I didn't get a sense that this would take me a long time to read through it, but mm-hmm. it ended up taking me a lot longer than I anticipated because there are sections. And I think this last chapter, Unknown to Himself, is probably the best example of that, where mm-hmm. the book becomes and I don't want to say wordy because that has a negative connotation, but it becomes much more prosy. In other words, there's mm-hmm. a lot of text and a lot of remembrances that where it seems to me the in these sections, the art takes a back seat to the text. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, think I would th- agree with that. Yeah, and I think throughout most of this adaptation of The First Man, the art is at least on the same level, if not even primary to the text. But there are certain sections every now and again where the text comes to the fore, and you really need to attend to that, and it can get rather dense. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and not only in terms of, you know, problems with trans, or not just, not necessarily with problems of translation. I think that Bloom seemed to do a really good job. It's just that, you know, Kimu was a very philosophical writer. Yeah. Uh, you know, in many ways, you know, I, I think people can read, if, 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 okay, let me say this. If they only read The Stranger, then I don't think they get all of Kimu, right? Because Kimu no. <laughs> intentionally wrote The Stranger in a way that was very similar to Hemingway, very sparingly in terms of language, very straightforward, mm-hmm. short sentences. I mean, look how it begins. Memol died today. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the first sentence, the famous first sentence of The Stranger. Um, and so it was written in a way that reflected Hemingway, who was one of Camus' heroes. But in his later works, he becomes much denser. He becomes much more philosophical. And obviously, we can see this in the essays, you know, like the myth of Sisyphus and the rebel and others, uh, but even in his fiction. And so I think if you go on to read things like The Plague or The Fall or even even some of the short stories, I think, to some degree, then there is kind of a density of language where it becomes – I don't want to say – Poetic, I think it does in places, but much more philosoph- but much more philosophical at times than I think poetic. Uh, and 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 so you have to go through it carefully. And I have to tell you that that last section, unknown to himself, I had to read that two or three times to mm-hmm. get even a beginning feeling that that I was digesting this. Okay, yeah, and I think uh, it's it's what's interesting, and it's mentioned in the. The intro, but also in the actual book, that um, what he was trying to do and, and the way his, his writing styles evolved, or maybe the writing, what he was uh, wanting to do with this big project, was actually channeling more Proust than he was channeling um, Hemingway in terms of his syntax and the length of his sentences. Um, and there is a point where Comery uh, is talking to. Uh, Jessica, who is a young woman, uh, they they are having a, a relationship, and he's taking her to Algeria to show her um, where he's from, um, and <clears throat> they are discussing his project. And there is this uh, comment that um, remembers of things past, or in search of lost time, because mm-hmm. a new title now is for the rich, and he wants to do. Uh, in search of lost time for the poor, 
because he comes from a very poor background, but he wants to have the same approach to describing memory uh, and how uh, childhood memories impact the, your entire life. And um, and the, in the comic itself, um, I really love the passages where Ferrandez is playing with timelines and flashbacks in a way that you can really only do, I think, in a comic where he's putting panels that have characters of different timelines that are in the same panel or shifting from one, uh, one panel to the next is two, two different time periods, um, but it's not indicated. You just figure it out visually that there is a, a shift and then you should be um, kind of connecting those moments um, in a kind of a non-linear fashion. There's a, a passage where um, as a child is crying and you see him as an adult remembering this, and uh, but he's, in, he's on a boat on his way to Algeria and he's very hot and sweating and there's this connection between uh, the, the representation of the tears as a child to his sweat as an adult. Yeah. And I uh, thought that was very well done. Um, and, you know, another, I think, visual way of bringing together the past and the present, you know, and I think mm-hmm. you, you gave an example of one, is in some panels we see different figures, uh, you know, especially Komori, uh, the mm-hmm. protagonist, in the same panel, both as an adult, you know, the one who's actually remembering the past, mm-hmm. and as a young boy, the mm-hmm. subject of what he's remembering. And it's almost like there are two people there together, the way that they're drawn. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's very fluid. It doesn't, uh, as you read, it doesn't, um, you know, stop the flow of, of the, the narrative, which is pretty, I thought was very impressive in the way it is, it is handled. You know, there's and, one, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, I, go I, there's something I wanted to ask you since yeah. we're talking mm-hmm. about the art. Now, one of the things that the woman who wrote the introduction, Alice Kaplan, states mm-hmm. at one point, it, she references this, you know, very brief two-page chapter, the third one, Paris, and mm-hmm. she says that – And this is in the penultimate paragraph of her intro. She says, not everything is so serious. Far from it. With a wink to his readers, Ferrandez imagines a cocktail party at Gallimard where Jacques Camery, the fictional writer, finds himself next to Jean-Paul Sartre, André Malraux, Gaston Gallimard, and Camus himself. Okay, so I turn now to those – that two-page chapter. This is 26 and page 27. And this Mm -hmm. is a cocktail party in Paris at Gallimard. Now, Mm -hmm. I can easily make out Sartre, right? Because Sartre with that wondering eye, or what do you call Mm -hmm. it, that that eye that's off in the thick glasses, you know, (laughs) it's unmistakable, okay? Yeah. For the life of me, I cannot find at this party Albert Camus. Mm. And I've looked at all the visuals. And in many ways, he's kind of distinctive himself because he, you know, he would sweep his hair back Mm -hmm. if you look at pictures of him. So I'm looking for a figure who's illustrated in the manner of having his hair swept back or combed back Mm -hmm. uh, in that distinctive way. I can't find anyone. So does Kaplan know something that I don't? Is this an extremely hidden figure? Could you find the Camus illustration? Well, yeah, it's, it's not exactly obvious, but I was thinking it might be, um, on page 27, the last trip, there is um, the middle uh, panel. Oh, the guy with the bow tie? It's a, yes, it's a close-up of, of uh, yeah, so you see in the background. I, I think that might be him there. Okay, I, I wondered about that. I don't think so. One, the facial features do not look similar at all. And also, I have never in my life <laughs> seen a picture of Camus in a bow tie, except may I don't know. Maybe he did wear one when he accepted the Nobel Prize. I'm not Possible. certain, but um, 
but why would he? Why would Camus be at a cocktail party with a bow tie? It just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Maybe it's not. I yeah, I had the same kind of thought. It's like I'm not really sure where they find him, but. And, and maybe Kaplan's mistaken in something like a wild goose chase. It's possible. Um, the the character with the little uh, scarf. Who's in the third panel on page 26? Mm-hmm. I believe that's, that's – let's see. That's probably Gallimard maybe. Hmm. I'm not what, sure. Gallimard which... or – I don't think it's Malraux, but um, – yeah, I would have to look at it again. And this this other character with a mustache, I don't know who that could be. But yeah, it's not obvious that, you know, he's not standing out like, uh, like Sartre is, definitely. <laughs> yeah, well, again, he's, you know, very distinctive in terms of the way that he looks. Yeah, and I thought when I read it, I, I was not looking at this scene as something extremely entertaining or funny, like it was presented in the, in the foreword. Uh, I think the overall tone of the book is very deep and rather serious, sometimes sad. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really see it as a monument of humor. <laughs> yeah. Um, this may be one of those lighter moments that Kaplan references. Yeah. And he's a, being a little playful, but it's not extraordinary comic. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you're right about the general tone of this adaptation is that it is quite serious, rather somber. And mm-hmm. I, I, I was very moved by this. And again, I wish I yes. had read the original prose version of The First Man. But mm-hmm. um, so I, I can't I can't really get a feel for what Ferrandez and the translator Ryan Bloom have done with this, which was a different experience from reading Ferrandez's The Stranger because I was quite familiar with The Stranger, and I thought that Ferrandez's The Stranger was a fairly accurate and respectful adaptation of the original novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, So I don't, I, I'm assuming that uh, this is the same but uh, not having read the first man, I'm not sure. But but I think this was a fascinating book. Yeah, definitely. The major takeaway for me in, in terms of the story and the history of um, the Franco-Algerian relationship is the way the book um, really highlights who the French, you know, who were the the people who, who went to Algeria. To colonize the country, mm-hmm. which is something we don't really talk about a lot in France, to identify these people and what were their motivations and where were they coming from, uh, what was their experience in France before they actually got to Algeria. Uh, we kind of describe them, you know, we say, okay, so we have the colonial people, and then they're, you know, they they had um, the next generation, and then we got what we call pied noir, black feet, right? So the the French uh, descendant of colonials that you know lived all their life in Algeria. But what I found fascinating in the book is the way he connects uh, very important events of French history with the colonization of Algeria. So we have this part where he's talking about how the uh, the first uh, settlers in this area who built the farms and infrastructures were. Uh, basically, in a situation very similar to people who, um, you know, the 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 people in the U.S., you know, coming from Europe and and uh, <clears throat> you know, going westward, it, it was very difficult. A lot of them died um, because of the the conditions. Uh, mm-hmm. And what was fascinating to me is that he's talking about those people being forty-eighters. I don't know if you remember this. It's, yeah, uh, mentioned page ninety-eight. Because Which it was, is a re- what, 1848. Yep. Yes, the revolution of 1848. Uh, so there are people who <clears throat> uh, were fighting the um, basically the um, restoration. They were because we the, the royal the sorry monarchy was back at that time, and there was a like a second revolution. Uh, <clears throat> so that connects that kind of movement of people who felt oppressed in France 
that you know move to Algeria for a better life um, and then start over. And then the same thing happened with the next wave, um, which would be Komiri's, uh, I think on, the, on his mother's side, he's talking about his grandmother, mm -hmm. um, who were from Spain, and then they move all the way to, to uh, eastern France in Alsace-Lorraine, that was lost in 1870 because of the, the first conflict with, the, with Germany, which is the precursor to World War I. Um, so these people were, had to leave because this area of France became German, and they ended up in Algeria. Um, and then he has this word, he says, this is the prosecuted become, becoming prosecutors, that basically they were oppressed and bullied because, um, you know, they were in a, their land was taken over by another country, basically. So they moved to to Algeria and they started oppressing the local people. Um, so that cycle is very uh, was very interesting to me the way it is presented uh, because I feel like, unfortunately, there are a lot of gaps in this uh, narrative. Uh, French um, history books are very sketchy. Um, and the way when I was in school, I never studied any of that. We never learned any of that. And uh, I, feel, I think it's that was very powerful to me. It's, it's kind of like the South's relationship with African-Americans, right? Uh, until yes. relatively <laughs> recently, you know, the, the true history of the South, especially – what many people in the South still call the, you know, the war against no Northern aggression was mm -hmm. rather watered down in history books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, of, of a resistance to confront the past. Uh, Correct. Exactly. And just imagining this story being told, you know, by Camus in uh, what we are, 1957. Mm -hmm. Is that right? 1915. Well, no, he died in 60. 60. Uh -huh. um, and I completely understand why this book was absolutely – it was impossible to publish at that time. Um, I would have been extremely um, controversial and it's it's just it goes to show how um, his level of thinking about who he was and where he was from and his relationship between the two countries was so, so deep. Um, and, uh, like it's only, you know, in the nineties that we were able to kind of grasp what he, what he was, uh, wanting to do now. Now I'm, I'm sorry they didn't get to finish this masterwork. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. may have impacted French culture in an amazing way. Mm -hmm. We will never know. Yeah. Now, you know, one of the things that you've been emphasizing is how Camus or Ferrandez, as in his adaptation especially, mm -hmm. is bringing to the fore Algerian culture, and especially mm -hmm. as it relates to France mm -hmm. or, or, or the Blackfeet. Um, Pied Noir. Yes, Pied Noir. Mm -hmm. And another part of that we get in the chapter – and by the way, there are 14 chapters, not 13. I was mistaken. Uh, but we get in the – I think it's the fifth chapter, The Father, His Death, The War. And this is where Jacques goes and does some does a little research on his father who died in the Second World War. Uh, first we, World War. I'm sorry. First. The First War. Did I say second? I, the First World War. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but we learn a little bit about, and I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, Zouave? Zouave. Les Zouave. Zouave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and these are Algerian soldiers who fought, and not just in the First World War, but in other wars. And they had, they were used in a unique way, many times as the first wave of a particular attack. But they also. Cannon fodder. Yeah. Yes, in many ways. Um, but they also had a quite unique way of dressing their uniform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were wearing uh, blue and red, and they were like moving targets, basically, for the Germans. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they were sent to the slaughter. Um, and it's a very odd thing when you think about it, because they're 
French people were moved to uh, Algeria. They were local people. They were, you know, fighting for France and being basically used, um, sent to their death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a very powerful image um, uh, when they describe this story. You see a row of soldiers, and the closer they get to the front, they become uh, like walking dead <laughs> zombies, but uh, like skeletons. Mm-hmm. I forgot what page that is on, but uh, visually very um, telling of uh, of what they were. What the story is telling. Yeah, this is another. Um, dark chapter that is brought forward. Uh, yeah. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the book does end on quite not only a prosy, but philosophical note. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think if, at least from reading the adaptation, again, not having read the original book, if I didn't know that the this book was incomplete at the time of Kimu's death, the way that at least this adaptation ends... I wouldn't know that this is an incomplete book. Does that make sense? Yeah, I have the same feeling. Yeah, yeah it is. And uh, I don't know if it's the way the the actual prose version was uh, organized. So it, it has a, we feel that it is complete. Or it is Ferrandez who made it uh, more of a complete work. But yeah, there's definitely so much. It's so rich mm-hmm. that if if – you know, 150 pages of, of his, his work was that rich. Imagine if he had done thousands, it would have been quite a piece of, uh, I mean, quite a monument. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. But yeah, I, I definitely don't feel that it's um, – and I was not – sometimes, you know, when you have uh, adapting uh, – sorry, adapting a literary work like this is – is a challenge in terms of how much text you you put that is actually maybe from the book or very literary. It kind of slows down the pace of um, you know uh, in, in comic form. Sometimes it's 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 not very uh, pleasant to read. Actually, uh, you feel like it's what's the relationship between text and picture? But I don't. I, I, at no point in this book I felt that way. I just felt it was denser. To, but I still felt it worked um, as a as an adaptation. I didn't feel it was too much. I thought it's it's at the end, so it's kind of a conclusion. Um, so it didn't bother me when I was reading the book that we suddenly have all this text. Mm. There was one thing I wanted to mention. It's a small detail, but I I don't know if you you know we often talk about. Uh, narrator and voices and who is speaking and the relationship between uh, word balloons and uh, uh, you know uh, blocks of text Um, and there's a passage where I felt there was a kind of a a strange shift so when the characters uh, when we have speech balloons he's creating dialogues between the characters and then sometimes we have narration right Mm -hmm. in the in the panels Um, and they are quite different because when characters talk, they, of course, they use their voices and they may be more informal, use slang or, or something like this, um, or a way to speak that is uh, matches their character, whereas the blocks of narration are more literary. But there is a small scene when um, the protagonist is in high school, so he's going to this, he got a scholarship um, Thanks to his relationship with Monsieur Bernard, his, his uh, teacher, uh, elementary school teacher, who kind of saw his talent and wanted to help him get a better education, convinced his grandmother that he had to go to high school and not take a uh, apprenticeship, um, which meant no money for the family for during the, the time he was he's going to be in high school. Um, so they are um, on the way to the high school. On the way to school, you remember that scene where they constantly uh, make fun of uh, um, a man who is bald, is selling things in the street, oh, yeah. and they call him right flight uh, flight. So they call flight steak rink um, or mosquito velodrome, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because he has no hair, so like insects will use his, his head as a as a landing pad. 
so they do it regularly, and one day when they do that, the man doesn't react. Usually he screams at them. But he has two other um, boys that he paid uh, to come and beat them up. And they're actually two local, they are probably uh, Arab uh, kids. So they are beat, beating up those two uh, you know, for, uh, French kids who are making fun of, <laughs> of, this, of this man. So there is this scene where they, they are running around and then they hop on uh, a streetcar to escape. And they are talking, and um, so uh, Jack is talking to his friend, and he says uh, he paid them to attack us, you know. And uh, and then they go, "We'll get him back. We'll rans- ransack his store and break his face." Though so they're pretty upset. And then there is a caption that says, "The next day we went on uh, our way," and the then the two you see the two characters talking, and the the um, the speech balloon says, "We chickened out." past tense commenting on what's happening so i was thrown off i see what's happening and then it goes on after all we were in the wrong so one of the characters says that and then uh jack's friend and jack says we were in the wrong and we were afraid of being beaten up and then we move to present day we see him as an adult he continues saying this later on page I'm in 145 hmm? yeah page 145 yeah mm-hmm. sorry good yeah, 145 and then he, he continues and says, later I made myself consider all of this again when I truly come to understand that men pretend to do what's right, but bow only in the face of force. And this is a strong point he's making about kind of his view and philosophy. But there, I, I was thrown off by this sequence in terms of uh, the, the narrative voice. Did you have the same? For this particular passage? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, that last panel where the present day Jacques says, later I made myself consider, you know, this again? Well, what happened before? Because you see the past Jack, right, Mm -hmm. speaking as if he's the narrator of his own story in the simple past and commenting on it, right? Why would they still sit, you know, be standing in the street looking at um, that bold person and say, we chickened out? They wouldn't say that, right? That's not dialogue. It's comment. That's a good point. You know, I don't know if I felt the same way when I read this originally, but it does make sense now that you say this. I mean, would these two young boys be admitting that they chickened out and turn almost philosophical? You Mm -hmm. know, it says, you know, we were wrong or, or, or at least feel some kind of shame and admit it one to the other. They may feel it, but would they speak about it? Yes, exactly. So I feel like the voice of present day uh, Jacques is just present here in the speech balloons. And I was wondering why at this particular time this is happening, maybe maybe to make us pay attention to his point. That's kind of an interesting little moment for me when I was reading. So it's just to show there's, I think there's a lot of um, passages like this that are kind of subtle in what Fernandez is is doing that makes that book, I think, very interesting and complex. So actually, two really interesting and in their own ways kind of complex books that we looked at on this, Mm -hmm. our late November episode. We started off with Edmond Baldwin's Piero, which came out in early November from New York Review Comics. And then after that, we looked at an adaptation of The First Man by Jacques Ferrandez. And this came out in October from Pegasus Books. Yes. And two books that, when we chose them, we didn't know that they would have so much in common. But then we read them and came to find out, wow, they work really well together. Yes, it's a great combo, maybe for Christmas, by both of them. Exactly. It's like the peanut butter and chocolate of comics <laughs> translations. Definitely. And High quality books. That's right. And as we pointed out at the top of the show, you can find great deals on books 
from both of these publishers, New York Review Comics and Pegasus Books, by going to the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Remember, go to dcbservice.com, and there you will find every single month mind-blowing specials. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your books there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Pick up that phone and dial 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. And if you want to get a hold of us by email, I am Pascal at comicsalternative.com. And you can also email me at Derek at ComicsAlternative.com or the show in general at Two Guys at ComicsAlternative.com. We're also on social media. You can find us and communicate with us via Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on TuneIn, and on iHeartRadio. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. And we do like to hear from you. We do. That's right. So please, please write. That's right. And remember, we will be back later this month with our official December Eurocomic show. Until then, I'm Derek. I'm Pascal. Take care. Au revoir.